Okay, everybody, let's get started. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today for our professional webinar entitled Cochlear Implant Outcome Measurements for Speech and Music Appreciation. We're absolutely thrilled that so many of you could join us today. So let's start by introducing ourselves. So my name is Donna Sporandio. I'm a teacher of the deaf and a certified auditory verbal therapist. And I'm lucky enough to have been coming into the Southeast Asia region for work for about seven years. It was lovely to see many names in the participant list that were familiar to me. So it's great to have you all joining us. We're also going to be joined by my colleagues, Rebecca and Adrian. Rebecca. Thanks, Donna. Uh, my name's Rebecca Claridge. I'm a speech language pathologist and certified auditory verbal therapist. I've been working for Medel as a rehabilitation manager for the past three or so years. And in that time, I've been a regular visitor to countries across Southeast Asia. I'm really looking forward to the time when uh, we can travel back to see you in person. Uh, but I'm really happy that we've got this opportunity to connect with you uh, via the internet and share this um, information about this important topic. Thanks. Adrian. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adrian Fuente, and I am the regional audiologist for Medell Southeast Asia. I've been working for Medell for the last 10 years, so I'm sure that I've met many of you in my trips um, in the region. It is a pleasure for me to be here today in this webinar about CI outcome measurements in speech and music appreciation. Donna. Thanks, guys. Now, you'll notice that all of your microphones have been muted. This is just so that we don't have background noise that interferes with our webinar. So your microphones will stay muted throughout. However, we have enabled the chat function. So we would really encourage you to be asking questions as we go through the webinar or making comments. We can't promise to get to all the questions, but we'll do our best as we go. Also, at the end of the webinar, we're going to be giving you an email address. Uh, so you're very welcome to use that email address to contact us. You can contact us with questions about the webinar, questions about our products, and we'll also welcome any questions about your particular caseload if there are ways that we can support you in the rehabilitation process. So we'll give you that email at the end of our time together. Okay, so let's get started. So our webinar today is entitled Cochlear Implant Outcome Measurements in Speech and Music Appreciation. And we subtitled our webinar Beyond Aided Pure Tone Audiometry. That's because we are aware that while pure tone audiometry is one part of the battery of assessments we're going to use for speech perception, we are aware that it has limitations. And so today we're going to talk through some of those ideas with you. So here's our plan for this morning. We're going to start by looking at some analogies of auditory access. Then Adrian's going to describe to us what some of those limitations are of using pure tone audiometry with cochlear implant recipients. Then we're going to look at some other measures, some tangible and realistic measures of speech perception ability. We're going to describe the implications of each of those. And finally, we're also going to look quickly at measures of music appreciation. So let's begin by thinking about some of the analogies that we might use or hear about when it comes to auditory access. You'll all be familiar, of course, with our audiogram. And I'm sure that many of you uh, have used and discussed the idea of the speech banana. The speech banana here in this uh, light colored region covers most of the sounds of speech. And because those fell into a kind of a banana shape, we've used that analogy of the speech banana across the years. 
More recently, we've also heard the analogy of the speech string bean. So this concept is thinking about those quieter sounds that are part of that speech banana and that are important for our recipients to have access to. So those are two auditory access analogies that have often been used to describe the need for our recipients to have good access to all the sounds of speech. So now I would like to ask Adrian to start off and talk to us some more about pure tone audiometry and what that means for a recipient of a cochlear implant. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Donna. So now we will discuss about how hearing level is evaluated. Certainly the gold standard for this is pure tone audiometry. Normally in pure tone audiometry, the person to be tested is inside a booth and through headphones, we present sounds at different frequencies and intensities. Um, so these sounds are called pure tones. In this slide, um, we can see a representation of a pew tone. As you will notice um, um, in this figure, um, uh, the pew tone has a frequency uh, that is produced based on the uh, number of cycles per second and also um, the, uh, the amplitude, which um, basically represents the intensity at which the sound is presented. Now, psychoacoustically speaking, uh, that means uh, perception of acoustic, of, of acoustic features of sounds. Uh, the frequency of sounds um, is perceived as pitch and the intensity of sounds is perceived as loudness. So during Pewton audiometry, the person has to tell us every time when they hear the sounds. In this way, we obtained hearing thresholds, which is normally uh, in the frequency range between 250 and 8,000 hertz. However, in the case of the small children, as they cannot tell us when they hear the sounds, we have to use visual reinforcements as a way of conditioning the child to look at the object or image every time when a sound is presented. Hearing tests using pew tones are useful to diagnose the presence of a hearing loss and its configuration, for example, high frequency hearing loss. We should note, however, that they provide hearing thresholds for pew tones and not for speech sounds. Now, it is important to make this distinction as pew tones and speech sounds are way too different. We will see that in the following um, slide. Um, so here we have spectrographic representations for two sounds. As you can see, uh, pewtons uh, look very different on a spectrogram than speech sounds. Uh, the acoustic information is very discrete. Here on the left um, panel, um, you can see a 2200 hertz pewtone right here, and the harmonics at 4400 and 6,600. There is no other acoustic information in there. So remember that this is what Pewton audiometry is testing, the ability to hear these discrete auditory experiences. Now, the problem with that is that it, it doesn't replicate what we need to do in real life listening situations. For example, on, on the right panel here, we can see another discrete uh, listening situation, the sh sound, right? Which indeed, might, we might actually have to listen to it in real life scenarios because it is a speech sound. As we can see here for the sh sound, uh, it carries a lot more auditory information than the pew tone. So making this sh sound easier um, to be detected. Now, in addition, pew tones put some cochlear implant users at a disadvantage owing to the processor's technical parameters. For example, Medell has invested a great deal of research into the internal and external technical design to optimize user's ability to process speed, not pew tones. 
Now, the ability to hear pewtones is not useful in everyday life. Very rarely we even have the opportunity to listen to a pewtone. And if we do, it might be an alarm, for example. Um, we will not be required to listen to that at soft levels. Um, so, um, pewtones can also be tested in the free field or sound field. Normally, CI recipients are tested in this condition. Um, so we obtain what we call aided thresholds or sound field thresholds. This means the lowest intensity at which pewtones of different frequencies can be detected with the cochlear implant. As you can imagine, this is not representative of a speech perception. Also, and which is even more important, Mapping dependent on sound field thresholds can result in adverse effects. So what I'm trying to say with this is that very low sound field thresholds means that low levels will be processed with the cochlear implant. So now you may ask, well, what is the problem with that? Well, we will see that in, these following, uh, in the following slides. But before that, um, there are at least two problems with um, this issue of two um, good um, hit, um, edit thresholds. First, we need to remember that the dynamic range with the cochlear implant is limited. That means that the dynamic range observed in normal hearing individuals, which is usually around 80 to 90 dB, has to be diminished to a final electrical dynamic range of around 55 dB. For this to happen, the system will necessarily compress the incoming signals. Now, the compression occurs between the middle and the upper level of the dynamic range. This ultimately means um, that speech sounds that are produced at normal conversational levels may be compressed. Uh, compression means that the acoustic features of sounds are modified and therefore it may become harder to discriminate specific components of speech sounds. We will see this concept of dynamic range and compression in cochlear implants with more details in the following slide. Now the other problem of hearing very soft sounds with the cochlear implants obviously is that um, real in real life, they, they're likely to be meaningless and thus with these we're enhancing audibility for soft and necessary sounds and reducing clarity for sounds produced at comfortable levels. Now note that with Medell we can change some parameters such as compression and electrical thresholds so the cochlear implant recipient can hear very soft sounds, although we do not recommend this. Now, let's see how the dynamic range and compression work in cochlear implants. First, what the CI system uh, does is to reduce the input dynamic range. This means that all sounds entering the speech processor will be converted into a 75 dB window of range, if you prefer. So in this figure will be the red line. So here the red line is representing um, the input dynamic range. So this 75 dB input dynamic range. Um, so the input dynamic range is managed um, by a feature called automatic gain control or AGC. So initially, all sounds are compressed into this 75 dB uh, dynamic range. Usually, the dynamic range covers sounds between 25, 25 and 100 dB. So then we will understand that the minimum level right here is close to the sound field threshold or edit threshold, okay? However, sounds have to be now converted into electrical pulses. So when the acoustic signal is converted into an electrical signal, 
a second compression occurs. Now, this time, the dynamic range is only 55 dB. This means that the difference between the loudest and the softest sound is only 55 dB. However, this electric dynamic range is active or adaptive, which means that it moves based on both uh, the intensity of the incoming sound and also the input dynamic range. So this active or adaptive sound um, window or dynamic range is this green um, shaded area we observed here. So if we look at this area, this is the 55 dB um, um, electrical dynamic range that I was talking um, about. Um, so in this figure, right, um, we observe that for a 55 dB um, input dynamic range, as we can observe here in the, with the red line, um, that goes between 25 and 100 dB, when an incoming sound is 35 dB, I'm gonna focus this right here, the maximum level within this um, active dynamic range is 90 dB, right? Therefore, any sounds from 90 dB and above will make no difference. Um, however, if the minimum sound now is 25 dB, just move it right here, now, the active dynamic range will go between 25 and 80 dB. So now any sounds from 80 dB and above will, no, will make no difference, right? No difference in terms of the stimulation levels with the current units that we provide uh, to the CI recipient. Also consider that sounds close to 8 dB, say 70 dB. Sorry, just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to. So any sounds um, from 8 dB and above uh, will, will make no difference. And also we should consider that sounds close to 8 dB, say 70 dB, will have also some level of compression. Now let's imagine a scenario where the air threshold is 15 dB, so we, it will be somewhere right here. Um, so 15 dB will be uh, the lowest level for the input dynamic range, right? So when we count 15 dB um, all the way down, when we sum up to, uh, with 75 dB, then we will reach to 90 dB. Now, the active or adaptive electrical dynamic range of 55 dB will move between 15 and 90 dB. So when a sound of 15 dB is presented, the active dynamic range will go between 15 and 70 dB because this is the 55 electrical dynamic range that I was just uh, previously talking. So you now know what it will happen. Sounds from 70 dB and above will make no difference. In addition, sounds that are close to 70 dB will be compressed, say sounds of around 60 dB. This means that speed sounds produced at normal conversational levels can be compressed and their acoustic features may be difficult to be distinguished. So, that is why too good in terms of edit thresholds may be problematic. Now I, hum, I handle the presentation over to Rebecca. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Wow, that was a lot of information for us to process. Uh, I'm thinking about the implications from the point of view of a speech therapist and uh, that last slide where you were describing about the limitations of the dynamic range, I think has got significant clinical implications for us. I'm thinking about children who uh, are presenting with those pure tone thresholds uh, really at really low intensity and what is happening for them at the upper end of that dynamic range. Uh, and it's really uh, com compressing very important speech information in what is uh, the, the loudness level of 
typical conversational speech. So for those children, Adrian, are you saying that actually there's a possibility that they're going to um, have much more difficulty perceiving speech? Yeah, that is correct. Absolutely. Yeah, and I guess then we have to think um, about the clinical implications that flow on from that. As a clinician, we'll be thinking uh, maybe that will uh, present challenges for them in monitoring their own speech production, developing their auditory feedback loop, uh, and then there's going to be a flow on in their own speech production. So I guess the key point here is that complete dependence on pure tone thresholds may not be in the best interest of cochlear implant recipients. So let's talk about more holistic ways of measuring um, outcomes for CI users by using speech perception for fitting and outcome measurements. So the number one reason that people choose a cochlear implant is for better understanding of speech. Nobody ever said, I'm choosing a cochlear implant so I can hear pure tones. So let's talk about speech perception. Um, can you type in the chat? Let's give you all something to do. Type in chat what you are doing, what tools you are using to measure speech perception in your clinic. I'm going to wait here and uh, have a look what you've, what your Ling Sound tech check for sure. What other ideas are you using for speech perception testing? Please do type in chat. I think by sharing your experience, uh, we can all learn together. Uh, medial consonant inventory, great, Th thanks. Other ideas? Open and close speech set, great. Long sounds, BKB. Okay, some great suggestions there. Thank you very minimum pair words. Terrific, thanks for sharing those ideas and we're certainly going to cover some of those in our presentation today. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to call your attention to this webinar produced by Jane Medell and available on Audiology Online. Um, while I'm just talking about it, feel free to uh, use your phone, open the camera feature and just hold it in front of this QR code uh, and your browser will automatically open um, the link and you can save that for viewing or reading the transcript later. Uh, in this webinar, uh, Jane Medell discusses the advantages of using speech perception to achieve best outcomes for both hearing aid users and cochlear implant users. Uh, her key point uh, questions the dependence on programming to prescription. And she challenges us with her statement that unless we test speech perception with the technology, we're not in a position to understand what the child can hear and what they cannot hear, how the technology is performing and what the audiologist needs to do to achieve uh, the maximum benefit for the child. I can recommend that. Um, so uh, Adrian, Donna and I are going to talk to you about these tangible and realistic ways of measuring speech perception for cochlear implant users. So let's get started talking about the Ling test. I think probably you're all familiar with the Ling test designed by Daniel Ling in the 1970s. So of course, in the 1970s, Daniel Ling was not working with children with cochlear implants. He was working with children who used hearing aids. And he used this test to identify if, he, uh, if a child could hear the sound um, and he could teach it through listening. If the child could not detect the sound, then he knew he had to use a different sensory input to help the child facilitate the development of that sound in their speech. Nowadays, with the advances in technology, we know that nearly every child can get access to all of the sounds of speech using contemporary hearing technology. So we use the Ling test for in, a, in different ways. We use it to firstly identify if the child is using the correct technology. 
Secondly, that the technology is working optimally. And thirdly, that it's been programmed correctly. So on this slide, you'll see some resources that we might use with parents to help them understand about using the Ling test, because we want them to be using this test every day at home. So here you will see the um, simplified audiogram that shows the frequencies and intensity of the Ling sounds. Uh, over here, you'll see these lovely cards uh, that parents like to use, actually clinicians like to use them too. Uh, these are available as a free download on our rehabilitation um, website at Medel. You can um, hop in there and download them and print them yourself. These ones obviously are in English, which I think pretty much also suits Bahasa Malay and Bahasa Indonesian. Uh, but you can find other languages there on the website in the uh, drop down menu. You'll find Tamil and Mandarin uh, to mention a few. The last uh, resource that I wanted to call your attention to was this blog, the Ling Six Sound Test Explained. So this is our most viewed and shared blog and it can help parents understand about how and why they are doing uh, to do the Ling Sound Test. But for professionals, it's important that we have a deeper understanding about the acoustic properties of the Ling sounds. Uh, so let's talk about formants. So formants are bands of sound energy that are unique to each vowel. Daniel Ling also understood the importance of formants. So he gave us a way to memorize the formants of vowels. And this is how it goes. We read this sentence down the column like this. Who would know more of art must learn and then take his ease. Now, I must admit, it is a bit of a clunky sentence, but I've got to say it has really helped me memorize the formants of vowels. So you take the vowel from each one of these words and then we look at the formants. So you can see the first formant of U starts low. First formants reach a peak at R and then drop down again for E. So if we read this sentence across the page from left to right, we will see the first formant go up and down like a little hill, up and over a hill. Let's look at the second formant. It starts relatively low for U, and then it really builds up. It rises steeply for E. It's like climbing a mountain. So when a CI user makes an error on the Ling sounds, we think about the formants of the sound that they said, and we compare that to the formants of the sound that they heard to identify the frequency range that their technology is not giving them access to. So I have an example of that uh, that happened recently to me. So my mum's um, next door neighbour got new hearing aids. He's been a very successful hearing aid user for many years. And um, he didn't like his new hearing aids. And he asked if he could come to my house to try uh, to use my piano. He wanted to use my piano to find out what was wrong with his hearing aids. And he came, he played the scale on the piano and he was disappointed because he couldn't work out what was uh, disappointing about his hearing aids. So I said, look, there might be another way, come into the office. And we did the Ling sound test. And when I said E, he said OO. So um, I got out my trusty chart and I showed him and explained. So what you're hearing here is the formant, the low formant of E, which is the same as the formant for U. What you are not hearing is the second formant of E, this information at about 3,200 Hertz. So for you, E sounds like U. Oh, he was very excited by that information and took a copy of the chart to share with his audiologist. I'm sure she already knew that, but he was very excited uh, because the other interesting piece of information is that 
he was able to repeat or identify the consonants in the Ling sounds. So this told us that there was a very narrow band around 3000 Hertz that his hearing aids were not providing access to. The other interesting thing I thought about upon reflection um, of this story is that piano keys play a single frequency note, kind of like a pure tone. So from the piano key, the single frequency note, he was not able to work out what the problem was with his hearing technology. It took a speech sound to identify that problem. Um, so telepractice is a hot topic, isn't it? Uh, we've all had to embrace telepractice, whether we wanted to or not, it has become part of our life. So I thought you might be interested in seeing how the Ling sounds might um, happen in telepractice. So I've got a little video I want to share with you of the Ling sounds in telepractice. To do that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my PowerPoint and I'm going to share the um, video directly. I'm hoping this works. I've got to say it's not 100%. Um, oh, and already I can see there's an issue. Let me have another try. Uh, it's never straightforward um, webinars. Here we go. Let's try. Come on, you can do it. Okay, I think we have it. I'm going to go back here. Uh, and let's watch. Nika doing the Ling sounds. Sounds with Nika. I know. So how about you do one ear and then I'm going to try and do the Ling sounds from here and see if Nika can hear me all the way from Australia. Okay. All right. So you do, maybe you can do her right ear, the one close to you. Uh, don't worry about me. We'll do the Ling sounds close today. So take off her left processor and just do the Ling sounds how you would do at home. Okay, so I usually uh, do Ling sound uh, two, up to three meters. Okay, just today, just do it beside her so that she doesn't feel uncomfortable with you away from being so unusual on the computer screen. Okay, Nika, siap ya. Kita mau link sound. Okay, Nika, siap? Iya. Yeah. Iya, yeah. dengar ya. So it was a little bit hard for me to hear all of those, but it sounded like she was repeating them back very clearly for you. Yeah, yeah. The audio is not so clear, so I didn't get to hear her repeating them, but she did those ones fine. She repeated it and... Okay, great. All right, can you take off her right processor and I'll try and get the left sounds from here. Oh, from you, okay. Yeah. So can you take off the right? Yes, already. Already, okay, Mika. Lihat. Monika Ungu. Dangakan. Can you ask him? Can you hear? Yeah, good job. I heard that one. Uh, yeah, good girl. Uh, um, yeah, good try. Did she hear that one? Yes, it can go E. E. Yeah, good work. Hooray! Yeah. All right, that was 
that's great. It's actually really hard to do that Ling sound test across the internet because the signal is not so good and there's a bit of a delay today. So she did really well with that. Um, you've really practiced that a lot at home. Well done. Okay, so what did we learn from, what did we learn from the Ling sounds? So in Mika's case, well, we learned that there were limitations uh, imposed by the technology. So the, the internet connection and also the limitation of our um, laptop microphones and speakers. But in that case, I can check with the mum, who in this case you can see is really capable. And the mum said, oh yes, Mika can copy. So Mika is giving us an identification response of the Ling sounds, which tells us that she has access to all of the uh, acoustic information in those sounds. Uh, if a child is not able yet to um, imitate the sounds, then we would accept a detection response. This tells us that they are able to um, hear at least some of the acoustic information in each of those speech sounds. Uh, let me just share my screen with you again. Uh, Excuse me, what Rebecca, else? we have a uh, question. Yes, let me just pop, I can probably see that. Should we use the Ling sound test at a distance with a louder voice? Um, that's a good question. And the answer is no, very simply. So when we start with the Ling sound test, we're going to do it close to the child at a conversational volume. When we move at a distance away from the child, and you could see that Mika's mum was used to doing that at home, we use the same conversational volume because we want to check what the child can hear of conversation at a distance, not can the child hear a loud voice at a distance. Um, okay, so just to finish up talking about the Ling sound test, uh, we need to consider if the child makes an error on the Ling sounds uh, when they're repeating them, we need to consider whether that's an error that relates to difficulties perceiving the acoustic qualities of the speech sound or whether it's a speech production error. So how's the child going with their speech production? Are there any developmental or atypical speech production errors in their repertoire? And the other point I wanted you to think about with the Ling sound test is that listening practice may improve performance or it might be that the audiologist needs to adjust the map. Uh, but I'll just give you an example of how listening practice uh, might improve performance. Um, you might see this with say an adult who has had a long term high frequency hearing loss. And then after the switch on of their cochlear implant, you might see a very tentative detection response to those high frequency sounds because they really haven't heard them before. And with listening practice, they can become more confident at that identification or that detection. Okay, so that's it for the Ling sounds from me for today. And I'm going to hand over to Adrian, who's going to talk about aided cortical auditory evoked potentials. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I guess you can all um, see my screen. Um, right, so um, now I would like to talk a little bit about um, objective measurements for speech perception in cochlear um, implant recipients. Um, so one of such measurement uh, is the aided cortical auditory abode potential. This technique evaluates um, the latency and amplitude of, of a cortical response um, that is generated by acoustic stimuli, such as syllables or even speech tokens, as we can see here in this slide. So, um, so these responses were obtained with, uh, with um, um, consonants, with um, speech tokens, such as um, s, j, t, m, and um, so um, we can determine, uh, so using um, the cortical avoid potentials, we can determine um, whether the CI recipient is able to generate these responses when we present these speech sounds at levels that typically occur in conversations, so say 55 dB at one um, meter. 
Um, so this is an example of how a test of auditory perception uh, using speech stimuli can be used to determine the need of programming changes in CI um, recipients. So um, now back to you, Donna. Okay, thanks very much, Rebecca and Adrian. So just to recap, we're looking at ways of assessing speech perception. So Rebecca has told us about the Ling sound test and some ways to, um, to use that to assess speech perception. And Adrian has talked to us about cortical auditory evoked potentials. So two ways there that we can assess speech perception in functional and realistic ways. So now I'm going to talk to you about another way that we can um, look at a child's speech perception and their progress with uh, the processing of those speech sounds. So in the early 2000s, Medell started working on the Little Ears Auditory Questionnaire. This is a great material that assesses a child's auditory development. Uh, so let's have a look at it. The Auditory Skills Questionnaire assesses auditory behaviour in children up to 24 months of age. Now that might be uh, pre-implant up to 24 months of age. We can also use it post-implant up to 24 months hearing age. This test has been really well validated. It was normed on over 3,000 normally hearing children. It's also available in many languages. It was validated on the first 15 languages that we translated. Um, and then after that, we were able, our statisticians told us that we were able just to keep going and translate into other languages. So perhaps of interest to the audience today, we have the questionnaire available in Mandarin, in Malay, Korean, Hindi, Indonesian, uh, of course, English. So uh, many, many uh, different languages. If you have a question about which languages it's available in, please email us at the end when we give you that email address. So the Little Ears Auditory Questionnaire has 35 questions, and we recommend that a therapist does this together with the parent. So you see on the screen there, there's the auditory response that we're looking for. Then we have the simple answer, yes or no, and sometimes there are examples of what that might look like in everyday life, which will help, uh, help you and help the parent to know what that's looking for. It's a great questionnaire to do. It's, it's inexpensive and it's quick. And it gives you actually a lot of really valuable information. I find that when I do it together with a parent, I actually learn a lot more about what's happening, even more than is in the questions itself. So when we've finished the questionnaire, we simply add up the number of yes, no responses. So you see an example here. Now the horizontal axis is age in months. As I've said, pre-implant, we would use this for the child's chronological age. It's actually a very useful tool uh, for a child who's using hearing aids. If you're not quite sure if they're actually getting enough good access to sound to develop their auditory brain, this questionnaire will help answer that question. So it's a really good part of a cochlear implant assessment battery. So horizontal axis, age and months. Post implant, we can reset the clock to zero and track auditory progress in those first two years post implant. The vertical axis is simply the number correct. So if we look at this point here, for example, we see a child who's about three months of age who has scored 11 on this assessment. If we look at this point here, at this time, the child is 19 months of age and has scored 24 correct. So this is how we plot our points onto the graph. Now, if the child is tracking on or above the blue line, we can assume that speech perception is adequate. For the auditory brain to be developing all of those skills, 
there must be good speech perception coming in. If, however, the child is tracking below that blue line, then it might be that the speech perception is inadequate. So there's a lots, of, lots of clues in here for us. And do remember that this dark shaded area here is the area of concern, an area of great concern. But we do need to take care with this assessment because it is uh, assessing more than just speech perception. It is assessing auditory development. And there could be other factors that are affecting that progress. For example, a lack of good spoken language models. So that's the auditory questionnaire, the Little Ears auditory questionnaire. And we do uh, recommend that you use that. The more that you use it, I think you'll find it extra useful. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Adrian. And Adrian's going to talk to us about measures of speech and noise. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, um, Donna. So I'll start sharing my screen. Good. Um, so um, we have some methods to test speed perception in sort of um, more realistic um, listening environments. Um, here um, on the slide, we have two examples of such methods. Um, now, in all speed um, perception tests, um, suddenly the person has to repeat back um, each speed stimulus uh, presented. So in one method, uh, we can present the speed um, usually sentences, and background noise at both at a fixed um, level. That means that the signal-to-noise ratio is not modified during testing. In such tests, we obtained a percentage of correct responses. Now, another way of testing speed perception in noise um, is with adaptive methods. This means that the signal-to-noise ratio is modified during testing. So changes uh, in signal-to-noise ratio depend on the person's responses. So for example, if we present a sentence, so we present sentences at different intensity levels in the presence of, of a background noise at a fixed level, right? So um, what varies here is actually the, uh, the speech uh, signal and not um, the, uh, the background noise. Now, using these tests, we obtain the signal to noise ratio necessary for the person to understand or to discriminate 50% of the speech material. Both these methods have limited relevance suddenly to uh, the speed perception tasks um, facing listeners in everyday life, um, where speech intensity and background noise levels um, vary constantly. Uh, but they do provide a sort of more realistic picture than pure tone audiometry, which, as we just uh, talked, um, assesses an individual's ability to hear a sound that actually they will most likely never hear in real life. Um, um, so, um, However, speech um, in noise um, test, um, they, they also serve to, to test speech perception in large groups of CI users. So this has allowed um, researchers to use uh, the results to compare the settings of technical uh, parameters, uh, such as the automatic game control, which adapts the challenging listening environments, uh, and also the input dynamic range that we just have uh, talked about um, during this presentation early. So now I will handle um, over to uh, Rebecca, who will talk about music outcome measurements. Terrific, thanks, Adrian. Uh, so I mentioned early, earlier that the number one reason people choose a cochlear implant is to improve their understanding and perception of speech. The second most cited reason for um, choosing a cochlear implant is um, to uh, increase their enjoyment of music. Uh, so let me just, sorry, I'm just gonna have to tab through this. Apologies, but another great look at those slides. Um, so let's think about how we measure music appreciation. 
Uh, you've all been very active in the chat. That's great to see all the questions coming in. Um, what I'd like to see in the chat now is how do you measure music appreciation in normal hearing listeners? What are your thoughts? This is a tricky question. Music appreciation, how do we measure it in typically hearing listeners? Anyone got Rebecca, any Could I just mention, just while you're doing that, can I just mention yeah. that we've got some black lines across your slide? I think you might just need to okay. move your mouse off the slide. Actually, Donna, I have to do something different, I think. Let okay. me just, I know exactly what to do. Thanks. Thanks for the reminder. How's that? Yes, much better, thanks. Okay, great. I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, <laughs> um, so who's, uh, we've got um, uh, guessing a song from its melody. That's a great idea. So for typically hearing listeners, we might appreciate music by uh, guessing songs. There's even competitions on the radio like that. I guess when I think about it for me as a typical hearing person, um, how do I assess uh, music appreciation, well, I think to myself, do I like it or do I not? Uh, body movement, according to us, yeah, we dance. We, we, if we enjoy and appreciate music, we might dance to it. Great suggestions. Doing actions and singing together. Terrific. So these are all very subjective ways of measuring music appreciation for typical hearing listeners. What about for cochlear implant users? What tools have we got to measure music appreciation? Type in chat. Of course, probably some of the same ones. We can um, respond to music with children. We're going to use that in our therapy. Anyone using any particular tools? Auditory closure is a strategy that we can use to check that a child is um, understanding and enjoying the music. Okay, people are a bit stuck there by the look, so let's go on. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at these three different ways of measuring music outcomes for cochlear implant recipients. So we're going to talk about subjective perception measurements, objective measurements, and third party recognition or performance, uh, like you can see in this beautiful photograph here that I actually took, hate to brag. Uh, so um, we have a beautiful young singer from Kazakhstan and she's performing with this charismatic Japanese guitar player. Uh, both of these performers are Medel Cochlear Implant users and they performed at the APSCI conference in Tokyo in November of last year. Uh, both of them are professional musicians. Uh, so when we're talking about outcome measurements um, of music appreciation for cochlear implant users, I wanted to call your attention to this uh, study um, published in 2012. Actually, it's a literature review of 18 studies that um, analyze cochlear implant users' appreciation of music. Uh, and the summary really clearly identifies that cochlear implant users do enjoy music using their technology. There's no denying that acoustic sound does provide a more continuous and complete um, frequency spectrum, but we can see from studies that uh, compare that have uh, bimodal users, so a hearing aid on one side and a cochlear implant on the other side, that these um, individuals choose to listen to music using both of their devices. So they prefer the, um, to use the cochlear implant in addition to the acoustic sound. Uh, so that's really important information to consider. Uh, in, at Medell, we've taken a special interest in music and we're really proud that our product provides cochlear implant users a more enjoyable experience when listening to music than other brands of cochlear implant. How do we know that? Uh, because of this study that I've referenced down here. It was conducted in Australia uh, using um, the subjects were individuals who had a Medel cochlear implant on one side and a different brand on the other. Uh, and they were asked about their enjoyment 
using music with each of their devices. Now, it's not a very big study. It's only five individuals um, because actually those conditions don't come up very often where somebody would choose to change brands of cochlear implant for their sequential um, cochlear implant. Uh, but what this study shows is that four of the five subjects in the study preferred their, the sound uh, of music using their Medell processor. Uh, the, fifth, the fifth individual said that uh, they liked uh, both equally. So this is really important research for Medell because there is a um, study show a very strong association between quality of life and enjoyment of music. So um, I'm going to hand over to Adrian now, who's going to talk to you about the similarities and differences in the acoustic properties of music and speech and how Medell technology adapts for that. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, sorry, good. Right, so um, so here in this slide, um, we can see uh, the spoken words for happy birthday um, on the left panel and then on the right panel, um, the uh, same happy birthday, but um, singing, right, happy birthday. So we can observe here significant differences um, in um, amplitude. I'm having problems with my cursor. Um, um, so we can see um, differences in terms of amplitude um, on the upper panel. Uh, middle panel in terms of the envelope, so um, basically amplitude and frequency both combined. And uh, finally, on the uh, lower panel, uh, we can also observe uh, frequency differences between um, when we say the words happy birthday and when we sing at these um, words. Now, um, just um, to provide very general information uh, about envelope and fine structure. So envelope, we can say that it's basically um, sort of the loudness contour of um, the, um, um, the acoustic um, stimulus, right? Uh, whereas fine structure provides um, frequency and sound quality information, which is certainly necessary for music appreciation. Um, um, Medell um, it, it takes very um, seriously um, uh, the idea of uh, providing uh, fine structure information. Um, as we know that fine structure information is extremely important for um, music appreciation, but also uh, for speech understanding, uh, specifically uh, in challenging um, Acoustic, uh, acoustical conditions. Um, so Medell has developed electros and some coding strategies with the aim to provide CI users uh, with enhanced experience when listening to music, as I said, and also when conversing in challenging acoustical uh, environments. So this technology can be summarized uh, in this slide and the, uh, the sort of umbrella term is tri triformans. So triformance represents the three major strengths of Medell cochlear implant systems that lead to superior hearing performance. So here we can observe or we can summarize um, um, structure preservation. Um, so with these surgeons strive for these uh, using the flexible electro array um, range, uh, complete cochlear coverage uh, which is achieved with long and tapered arrays, uh, and then fine hearing, which is the coding strategy that gives most um, information about um, sound. Uh, here in this slide, we have a study uh, conducted in Germany in 2012 with 46 CI um, adult users. This study investigated the subjective um, perception of music uh, with CI using two coding strategies. One coding strategy did not provide fine structure and therefore it provided only envelope information, whereas the other sound coding strategy provided uh, fine structure information, that means fine hearing. As we can see uh, from this slide, not on, specifically on the left panel, 91% of participants who received a, a coding strategy based on fine structure 
preferred um, that music was enjoyable versus 67% of participants who received a coding strategy now based on envelope information, right? So we can see here that fine structure processing provides enhanced sound experience, such as music appreciation. So now I will handle uh, over to Donna. I'm having problems with my mouse. That's why. I'm That's trying. okay. Okay, good, great. Okay, thanks, Adrian. I was really interested to hear, Rebecca, that the uh, second most stated reason for getting a cochlear implant was appreciation of music. That was really interesting. Okay, let's look in a little bit more detail at the study that Rebecca mentioned. I think there's some useful information in here for us as rehabilitation professionals and how we can go about providing a music program for those who receive cochlear implants. Certainly it is our recommendation that music should be an integral part of rehabilitation, both for children and for adults. We know that music is all about listening. So having music as a key part of our rehabilitation programs is a great idea. So let's look some more at some more of the detail of the study that Rebecca mentioned. So first of all, the study showed that the cochlear implant user's ability to perceive pitch and timbre differences is poorer than normal hearing. That's not to say that it's not there, but it is to say that it was reduced compared to normal hearing. The study showed that the cochlear implant users could identify and discriminate rhythm elements of music in just the same way as normally hearing listeners. So rhythm is a key part of the musical program that we're going to present. Perhaps we can choose uh, rhymes and songs with young children that have lovely, strong rhythmical elements to them. The study showed that cochlear implant users preferred songs, familiar songs with lyrics over those that didn't have lyrics. So I think particularly for our adult population, this is useful information for us. At least when we start in music with adults who've received cochlear implants, we can look to find those adults' familiar songs and choose those that have nice, a nice strong lyrical component to them. So being able to hear the words in the song really helped that listener to uh, map that experience onto what they had heard before. So I think that tells us that we're going to choose songs with good strong lyrics, perhaps even print out a lyric sheet for our user to follow along with in the early stages post implant. And that might help them really start to be more familiar with what they've heard before and to really start to enjoy their musical experience again. Now it's interesting to think of, of um, cochlear implant users who have single-sided deafness when it comes to music. These users can give us a lot of really interesting information about what the cochlear implant really sounds like to them. So here it was reported that in single-sided deafness uh, individuals who had a cochlear implant, so normal hearing one side, cochlear implant the other side, they were asked to listen to music in two conditions. In the first condition, they listened to music without their new cochlear implants, so just with their normally hearing ear. In the second condition, they were asked to listen with the normal hearing and with their cochlear implant processor. So when that was added in on top, which did they prefer? Well, the, these single-sided deafness users reported higher enjoyment in music when they were wearing their cochlear implant processor. So even though they actually had normal hearing on the other side, the provision of the cochlear implant improved their perception of music overall. So I think that's a really nice uh, piece of information for us because it helps us to understand that the, the signal that's coming in is really useful, even for people who know what normally, so, even who people who know what music sounds like with normal hearing. So what about third party recognition? What do we mean by that? We mean uh, cochlear implant users 
who are performing music and others are listening to them. What do we know about that? Well, we know that some cochlear implant users are professional musicians, and that includes those who play instruments and those who sing. At Medell, we have a specialist in music and she uh, uses cochlear, um, uh, cochlear implant. She is a professional singer. She was a professional singer before she lost her hearing and she's been able to take up that career again since. So there are many examples of musicians who are continuing their careers with both with playing of instruments and in singing. We have cochlear implant users who participate in music competitions and I'm going to show you one in a minute. Many of our cochlear implant users we know do enjoy entertaining others socially with music. So while they might not want to be at the professional level with their music, they really enjoy being part of musical groups and performing maybe for their friends in a social situation. We also know that we have lots of cochlear implant users who like to share their playlists with their friends. So I would encourage you again in the rehabilitation program, look at your caseload overall See if you can find someone within there who might be a professional musician or who might um, really enjoy sharing their musical experience with the others. I have been asked, what about children? Uh, is it good to teach children a musical instrument? And my answer to that would be yes, definitely yes. Learning to play a musical instrument is a completely listening based experience. So it will build those auditory structures in the child's brain. So if you have parents come to you and ask, can my child benefit from attending music lessons? The answer is definitely yes. They might be structured formal lessons to learn an instrument. They might be joining in with a group of other children and musical experiences. All of those we absolutely recommend for um, cochlear implant child, um, implanted children. So let's have a look at this lovely video. Every two years there is a um, festival where cochlear implant users all come together and perform together. And in 2015, this was held in Poland. So I want to show you this video of uh, some of the performers at this meeting.
Now, I believe that the uh, visual aspect of that might not have been quite clear to you, and I'm sorry if that happened. Uh, I hope you could see enough to see how much those musicians were enjoying themselves. And I hope that you could hear enough, at least to hear what wonderful and talented musicians they are. If that wasn't clear enough for you to see, then please go ahead and Google that, won't you? Uh, and Medell does have a YouTube channel. So do have a good look and see, um, have another look at the Beats of Cochlear Festival. Okay, so that's bringing us to a close of our webinar presentation. Uh, let me just show you our references for today. I'm going to leave these up for a moment so that you can jot down anything you would like to. But please, if you want to know anything more about what we've said or any of the studies that were mentioned, then please do uh, email us. And there's our second lot of references for today. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick summary of what we've spoken about, and then we might have time to answer a couple of your questions that have come through. So a summary of what we've talked about today. First of all, we looked at some analogies of auditory access. We discussed the speech banana and the speech string bean as analogies that we've heard of around um, looking at the access to speech sounds that uh, that recipients of cochlear implants need. Adrian gave us a lot of really useful information about the limitations of pure tone audiometry. Adrian encouraged us to see that as one part of the battery of tests that we use to assess outcomes, but to know its limitations and to make sure that we see it as one part within a bigger test battery that's looking at functional progress. Then we looked at what might be really useful measures of speech perception ability. Rebecca talked about the Ling test. Uh, Adrian told us about the aided cortical auditory evoked potentials as a more objective look at access to speech sounds. I talked to you about the Little Ears auditory questionnaire. It really is a great part of that test battery of outcome assessment. So we encourage you to look at that. And then Adrian gave us some information about testing speech and noise, because all of these all of these assessments we're looking at are looking into real life and what happens for these patients in real life, not that situation of pure tone audiometry in a booth, which, as Adrian said, actually is almost never what happens in real life. And then finally, we looked at some measures of music appreciation, because we know that music. Uh, perception of music leads to better quality of life for our recipients. Now I mentioned that we will give our email addresses, so here they are. As I said, you're welcome to email us with any question at all that you have about the webinar, about our products, about rehabilitation, and certainly about your specific caseload. So there are the rehab um, Southeast Asia email addresses. So I'll pause for a moment so that you can jot that down if you need to. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left of time. So we've asked one of our colleagues to keep track of all the questions that came through. So Eros, can I please ask you now to come in with a question that you've selected from all of the questions that came through in the chat? Um. Ross, your microphone is muted. Okay, instead of that, I'm going to look at the questions that are here on the chat myself. Uh, Someone has asked, 
Mm, sorry, Adrian, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, can I just jump in? Um, yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, good. Because I, I saw um, uh, two questions um, that I would like to, to answer. Um, so one of them was about the speed test that, that I was referring to. Um, and so the question was whether they were recorded or whether we used um, at the, at the um, you know, whether we say them alive, right? So, um, no, so the, 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 the test material is definitely recorded. So because we do want to control for the quality um, of, you know, of, of those uh, the speed um, stimuli. So the materials are recorded. And some of those tests, like the hearing and noise test, is, uh, um, are actually available um, in, in many different languages. So that's one of the questions. Um, and the other question that I want to just refer very quickly is about saying, so uh, measurement and CI, CI outcome using Puton audiometry or aid thresholds, I guess, is not really accurate. Um, Lin6 is much more accurate. Um, well, what I would say to that is that it's not that it's not accurate. It's just, it's not giving us the entire picture right? Uh, we certainly want to use um, edit thresholds or sound field thresholds, just like a baseline. But we do need to use other tests. And Rebecca and Donna here were explaining um, with lots of details how we can use, for instance, the link sounds. And so using link sounds in addition or along with uh, Puton uh, edit thresholds, um, it, it would be very good. So the idea here is that we should not focus only on pure tone audiometry or on edit thresholds. Okay, super, thanks Adrian. So I think that feeds in again to that idea that we need a battery of tests to look and assess a person's outcomes post implant. Now, of course, we haven't even mentioned today going further into those assessments, looking at assessments of language development, for example which is a further consequence of access to speech sounds. But even when we're looking at speech perception, we're saying we need this battery of assessments so that we're not relying on only one. There's a question here about the Ling test for unilateral hearing loss. I wonder if you might answer it for us, Rebecca. Yes, yeah, uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Super, Yi Yan has asked about doing the Ling test with unilateral hearing loss. So masking on the good ear using an earplug, as she said, is going to re reduce the noise level somewhat, but speech stimuli, mm, so how might we use that test for unilateral hearing loss? So I've got two suggestions for you for um, if you've got a client who has single side deafness and using cochlear implant. Uh, in all of the rehab, you're uh, ideally you're going to um, completely mask the uh, ear that has got good hearing or typical hearing or better hearing. Uh, but that's not really possible to completely occlude that. So we want to use um, technology to provide the input directly to the cochlear implant processor. So we can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, that could be with recorded content. So you could record the link sounds and there's actually a few different apps that you can access to deliver the link sounds and provide them to the processor using direct auditory in, audio input. Uh, and the second way would be to use an FM system. So you probably, if it's a young child, you would want to um, have two people involved in this and the speaker who is delivering the link sounds would be in a different location outside the room and deliver the sounds using the FM um, transmitter and then the child would repeat or detect the sound and the adult in the room with the child would document those responses. Um, they're my two ideas. Donna, have you, uh, can you think of any others? I think that's excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. Um, Adrian, can I ask you a question, please? Sure. Uh, we had a couple of thoughts and questions along the way in the chat about the frequency of mapping post-implant. So what would be a typical mapping schedule for someone after they receive a cochlear implant? And then why might we need to move away from what is typical according to what we see in the outcomes? Right, so I would say that it really varies, really. I definitely think that it depends on, on, on the clinician in particular. 
um, there are other factors like distance, right? So maybe the user lives far away from the clinic. So in that case, you will need to schedule appointments maybe once a month uh, or every seven weeks. Um, so normally I would say the right after switch on, you may want to see the child once a week, uh, probably. So that would happen during the first um, four weeks right after switch on. Um, then you may want to see them once a month, I think. Now, the, the frequency uh, may change if you are observing something that is not normal or say you expect some progress and you're not observing that progress. So in that case, I think that probably you will, you will want to see that particular CI recipient more often to check, you know, check the processor, uh, also check again the map, maybe um, check edit thresholds, but always along with um, therapist feedback. That's very, very important, right? Um, so also the therapist um, may say to us, oh, you know what, I don't think this child is progressing according you know, to, to what I expect. And so in that case, we may, we may want to see, or we may need to see the CI recipient more often. Okay, thanks, Adrian. And of course, over time, if things are going well, those mapping appointments are, appointments will stretch out further and further. Yes, that Super, is correct. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and I really like that you mentioned about therapist feedback. At Medell, we believe it's really, really important to have that constant interaction, therapist and audiologist, so that the therapist is looking more perhaps at the real life measures, looking at what the child's actually doing with the sound they're receiving. Uh, the therapist is going to be using that Ling sound test regularly and recording all of those results. So these are great ways that we can be in touch with our audiology team and work together to get the maximum outcomes for our recipients. Now, if you have any particular questions about a child you're working with who's using a Medal cochlear implant, again, you're very welcome at any time to be in touch with us. We are here to help. Whether or not that's a mapping question, um, a pure tone audiometry question, or a question about real life development, about auditory development or language development, please, we're here to help you as professionals. So, and we might not have all the answers, but a discussion together often comes up with some new ideas, doesn't it? So please keep those email addresses in your mind. Um, at the moment, as Rebecca said, we're not able to travel, so we can't come and see you, but please, we would love to hear from you in the meantime. Now, just one more question for you, if you might please, Rebecca. Another question about the Ling sound test. What would be the maximum distance to test the Ling sounds? So could you talk to us a little bit about using that test at distance, please? Sure. So um, earlier in the presentation, we talked about when you start doing the Ling sound test, you're going to do it up close. And then as the child gets more experience, you're going to encourage or coach the parent to deliver the sounds at a distance. So in a typical clinic room, that might not be very far. If you've got a small office, it might just be one or two metres. Uh, but we know that children with cochlear implants can do the Ling sound test up to five or six metres. But typical, it would be about between three and four metres. Okay, thank you. So up close is going to assess a close conversation. Can the child hear those sounds close? And at three meters, can they hear those softer sounds when the, when the conversation's further away? And just one last question about the Ling test, please. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has mentioned combining the sounds. So I think what this means is that, uh, so typically we present the sounds one at a time. Ah, uh, ooh, et cetera. And sometimes people want to combine the sounds so that they're presented such as ah, uh, ooh, for example. What are your thoughts on that, please? So uh, I wouldn't combine the sounds like that. And there's a very clear reason for that is because when we combine the sounds and they transition from one sound to another, the formants will change. And then we are not assessing the discrete formants 
as Daniel Ling identified in the test, is designed to. Uh, so that transition part would be problematic for the Ling sound. However, recently I did do something quite fun with the child and that was to deliver two discrete sounds. And it came, be, became kind of like a bit of an auditory memory task as well. So we might say something like shh, e. So there is no transition. There's no, not one sound into the next. Uh, and this child was an experienced listener and uh, had a lot of practice with the Ling sounds. And he was six or seven years old, so uh, very experienced. And he, was, he actually quite enjoyed that task. Uh, so um, that's an option rather than transitioning between the sounds. Mm. And I'm presuming that that child was able to imitate you. So he was able to repeat that back. And so you're still getting the information that you need about whether or not the child can actually hear the sounds. Yes, you could yeah. not produce, you could not deliver two sounds if you were doing the task as a detection level task, because then you're not going to get the information you need about each individual sound. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, and there was one other question, which I think I answered during the webinar, which was about um, cochlear implant users and singing. And can cochlear implant users sing? And, and are there some users who become professional singers? Yes, we certainly have had examples of that. Um, and we certainly recommend using lots and lots of songs and lots and lots of music with our recipients, whether they're children or adults. Okay, so I'm going to bring our webinar to a close now. Thanks very much to, to everybody for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. So thanks to Rebecca in Australia and Adrian in Canada and goodbye from me as well in New Zealand. We hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.